Messmann and Sören Wackenteam. Welcome! Let's get started. First of all, thanks for sticking around to the last talk. I hope you have still energy for one uh, last presentation today. Um, and of course, thanks for inviting us to let us talk here. Right. My name is Richard Messmann. As uh, we already heard, I'm a UX designer at Innovation Native. My name is Sören Wagentin. Um, it's a Danish name, but sadly, I need to say now I'm not Danish. It's only my name. My father said or used to say that Sören Lerby, um, he was a football player, that he was the best midfielder in the world, and therefore he gave me the name. But um, I was born in Germany, so quite a pity I, I just noticed today. Yeah. <laughs> My name has no history behind it, I think, so we'll just get started. <laughs> okay, so first of all, before we get into the topic, um, a few words about Innovation Natives, because most of you probably um, don't know us. Um, we're a company based here in Hamburg, and what we do is we basically develop products of all kinds for a lot of different um, companies of all sizes, and to go a little bit into detail on that, um, we do physical and um, digital products, services, um, whatever is needed for a large range of um, clients that starts at small startups that want to launch their first product. But we also um, do work for really large clients, um, airlines, and a lot, of in a, a lot of transportation industry things. Um, and a lot of things that are also very public in the public space, um, which is a huge range. And that's kind of the perspective we want to give you today, um, the perspective uh, on navigating uncertainty. And Sören is going to get us started on the topic. Right. So, um, yeah. As you already mentioned, or I don't know if you already mentioned, our topic is the power of purpose. No, you mentioned that. Yeah, it's the power of purpose. Um, I don't know if you know what a purpose is, but I think it's like a fashionable word these days, so you probably have heard uh, about it. Um, now, what I would like to tell you about is um, there's a book called The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. Anyone knows about Simon Sinek? Right, most of you. That's what um, I thought, and I'm not going to get too much into detail, but it's like uh, kind of the context that I want to um, give you. So in his book, he um, presents this hypothesis um, that companies are successful in the long term if they do not pursue only short-term goals. And I think that's quite an interesting view as I, when I look back at all the talks that we had today, I feel that there was a lot of speed inside. There was a lot of thinking that our world is changing so fast and is moving so quickly. Um, we need to kind of react to that fast, um, changing world. Um, and now here comes the view saying, all right, but we ne need to take a look at the long-term goals. Now, this hypothesis um, is nothing that comes out of the blue. It is based um, on the idea that companies that are successful are not interested in winning, but in not losing. So it's not about winning. Um, it's about not to lose. Because, after all, anyone who wants to win something is pretty much automatically part of the game of being better than someone else. We heard a lot of, uh, about collaboration, and I feel this is kind of the perspective that we should take a look at. Um, now, as UX designers and UX researchers, we are always having different perspectives uh, and backgrounds, and we always develop different ideas because we're working for different companies, we're working in different environments and in different uh, projects. So that, that's all fine, that's all totally good, but we believe that it can, can become uh, problematic when we start a competition in the sense of being better than someone else. If we do that, we get into trouble. Because the big question is whether a mindset that says, I want to be better than someone else, will make our products, our services, our society, in other words, um, the world that we live in, a better place, or whether this perspective, being better than someone else, will only satisfy the interests of a small group, and this small group is mostly made up of those um, who place the contract, or our clients. Um, now, let's say we can agree that none of us in this room um, wants to design or be part of a, a project um, where a, pro a product does nothing but help um, the person who owns it or the organization, the institution who owns it, get richer. That's like the only value in a product. Would we say that we want to be part of that kind of project? I believe 
um, we would not like to. Now, if that's true, um, we've brought a question for you, and we think we should always ask ourselves um, this question. In every project, every step of the project, and sometimes even after we finish the project. And the question is, um, do we want to build the best problem solution of all, or do we want to build um, a solution that solves a problem? Now, I don't know if you get uh, the difference or if that kind of recognizes um, with what you think, but um, I feel that there's like a big difference. And the big, big difference is building the best problem solution can't be something like a just cause. It can't be something um, like a purpose because it's based on metrics and on time frames that someone chose or selected. And this position is only temporary. So you need someone to tell you you are the best or your idea is the best or your solution is the best. But the thing is that persons and positions are constantly changing. So once there is one telling you, you, you made a good job, you are the best, and that's why you get the contract or something like that, um, you have a problem if this guy left. Because then no one else is telling you um, the same, maybe, could be. Now, if we look at projects that way, we might ask, um, how the hell should we know what to do when there is no one who could tell us? And we believe that here comes the good thing. And for us, it's kind of a way out of all this uncertainty that we are constantly talking about. And that is, if we find a purpose and a real just cause in what we are doing, basically ourselves, we can use this power, and we call it the power of purpose, to build products and services or applications, whatever we design, whatever we build, um, that are actually worth building. Right. In other words, um, we reduce uncertainty to keep it like that, or to get it like that, when we can be sure that the motivation to build whatever we build is a legitimate one, a legitimate motivation to ourselves, and it's not just pursuing monetization interests. It's not just about meeting our KPIs. KPIs are fine, they are good, but it's not just about that. And it's not just about satisfying the interests of our stakeholders, it's rather about trying to act according to our just cause. And assuming that we in this room are all human beings trying to kind of help other human beings in what we design, um, then it's quite easy to say if we follow our own just cause, society as a whole benefits and not just a small group. Okay, so now... Um, that was the theoretical part. Yeah, exactly. So now we heard a lot about the theoretical part, but uh, what the hell has, does something... What the hell does having something like a purpose or a just cause mean for me as a UX designer or for you as UX designers? And um, to give you the whole scope a little bit, um, at Innovation Days, like I said, we work on a whole lot of different um, types of projects, and uh, there's some of them where we notice there's a different kind of motivation and energy in them, and they feel more worthwhile, and there's a... Um, different kind of energy there, and these examples include stuff like the digitiz digitization of education, uh, the mobility revolution, the future of work, and something like sustainability in the ecological sense in um, digital services. And um, all these different kinds of projects and the differences we notice lead us back to the question, why do we actually work as UX designers? And sure, I'm sure we all love our job, and uh, of course we all need money, that's <laughs> one motivation, but in all seriousness, um, at the end of the day, we want to help our clients and the users achieve their goals. And I think there's a question we need to answer first. Before we take these goals we want to achieve and put them into interactions and experiences, I think we have to ask ourselves, um, to what extent are these goals actually worth pursuing? And uh, I know this is an incredibly loaded question. It's an incredibly diff difficult question, and everyone has to answer it for themselves, um, because uh, the answer is not the same for any two people here. But I think as UX designers, we have a responsibility that comes from being the ones with the mandate and the, the kind of the power to change, guide, and shape behavior. And so I think we have to face this question um, in all the projects we do. And I'll talk a little bit about an example we experienced. Um, unfortunately, I think you all know this, um, all the best projects we do, we're not allowed to talk about them. <laughs> um, and the most recent project that's still ongoing, we can't show anything. 
but um, I'll try it in a very abstract way, and I hope um, I can get my point across. So um, I'll tell you something about a mystery project we did, an uh, unspecified one. Um, we recently worked on it was a longer project, and generally speaking, the job was to design and uh, to test and design something for use in public spaces, uh, and something almost everyone who moves around in an urban environment uses or even has to use. Just uh, that's I can't get more specific than that. But um, <laughs> I think it's okay to be abstract. Um, it works for this example, and. As we heard before, um, uncertainty and complexity are kind of intertwined, and as soon as you say, okay, pretty much everyone is our target group, it gets very complex. But um, we started, as we always do, with a very user-centric approach and just started talking to these people, doing interviews, um, focus groups, um, building very low, low five prototypes, and as Nono told us today, um, testing desirability things, quickly sorting out things, and then bit by bit um, building things that kind of uh, play into the expectations, the needs, and the specific requirements of all these different kinds of people that uh, are supposed to use it in the end. And at the time, it seemed pretty clearly defined what we wanted to do here. Um, just improve the experience at these contexts in uh, the urban environment. There was already something in place, and it should be better. And we had um, certain technological frames that we had to um, use and stay in of. So um, with all this research, all these learnings, we designed and developed solutions. We had uh, several, uh, a lot actually, iterative prototypes and development loops. And somehow, someday the day came where we rolled out the first um, test products in the real context, working, everything. We had all our tests, and all the tests with these prototypes um, were very positive. Um, users were happy, the stakeholders were very happy. Everyone seemed happy, and uh, so was I. Um, and everything seemed great. So uh, this was a moment where I felt uh, very good and content, and uh, my whole team did. And I just felt like going home, sitting in a big comfy armchair, you know, um, lighting a cigar and drinking a fine red wine, as I always do after a job well done. Looked a little something like this. No, of course it's exaggerated. I, I don't really like red wine, I don't smoke cigars, and I wish, I wish I had a big comfy armchair, but I'm not at that point in my life yet. But, um, Still, this is, this is how I felt, and it just felt very good. It felt like we made a change, we developed something really good that users responded to in a very, very positive way, and that pretty much has a relevancy for everyone. And in this whole project, I felt a different kind of motivation, that somehow we really made a change or an impact. Um, unfortunately, that feeling didn't last very long. Um, <laughs> this happened, because shortly after these test products got rolled out, um, I got a message. And um, to summarize it in a few words, uh, the message said, uh, these new things you made, they're not great. In fact, they're awful. We hate them. We can't use them. <laughs> um, which isn't very good at all. So, uh, of course, you know, as UX designers, we get all kinds of constructive and not-so-constructive criticism. So it's not very unusual. And the, the overwhelming feedback was very positive. 95% of the people were very happy. So... Um, we could have just said, no, okay, so what? But uh, this was actually different. It turned out this um, person was from a particularly vulnerable group we've, we also questioned before, who also has the users, and um, who we also in extensively interviewed. We built prototypes with them, and we did everything we could in the technical framework to cater to their needs. Um, and uh, the people we talked to also had a very positive reaction to it. But he was this voice telling us, the old things weren't great. In fact, they were very bad too, but they were better than this, <laughs> better than what we have now, um, which is still not very good. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that was the point where, of course, we could have said, um, yeah, the project's done, and we're finished, the, the client is happy too, and the overwhelming feedback is positive, everyone says it's pretty good. And um, on the paper, it's a success. We defined the metrics of success before, and um, the feedback was according to it, so it was a success. But it uh, didn't feel like it at all. It felt like a huge failure. I was absolutely devastated, because here was this project we worked on um, so extensively and with such a high drive and motivation. Uh, we thought was catering to everyone, and suddenly um, this very small group of users, but users that really depend on it and need it, uh, told me uh, we can't use it anymore. Before we could, we could use it, it was okay, and now we can't anymore. And suddenly this whole house of cards started crumbling, and I 
started to question all these things we had, and this uncertainty that we kind of swatted away before came crushing right back and um, was there in full effect. Right, what I can tell about that is I remember um, the day it was like Corona, so we had um, our meeting like remotely, and um, yeah, Richard really looked bad. You could see in his eyes that he was not satisfied at all. Um, what I got to tell is that he's um, working in a, a, a different team than mine, so um, I didn't know exactly what was going on, but I could definitely see that there's something um, that didn't work out quite well. And for me, it was quite exciting to see that the whole team that he was working with um, had some kind of intrinsic motivation um, to develop something for the better. And it was kind of our own just cause or part of our own just, just cause at Innovation Native saying we want to um, solve real problems um, that led the team being kind of personally uh, struck by having worked on something that made things worse for at least a small um, small group inside um, the users. Right, and I think that's just another aspect of the power of purpose which we are talking about. And um, when we commit ourselves to just cause and things get uncomfortable, like in this um, p p uh, sp specific um, example, we are much more uh, likely personally affected than if we're just doing our, our job. If we're just doing our job, he could have said, all right, I'm going to close that door and there will be some kind of new door that I go in. But um, this was not the case. And I think on the other side, that's like the power of purpose as well, this kind of personal involvement um, is also the engine that drives us to change things. Yeah, so um, back to the story. So what actually happened? I mean, did we do a really bad, a really shitty job or did we forget something? Um, it's not quite as easy as that. We, the product was over. We were done with it, but we started uh, digging and it quickly became apparent that in this uh, technology frame that we had before, that it just wasn't feasible and suitable for this user group, that it, just the starting point of the project wasn't really suitable for them at all in the slightest. And we also dug deeper and learned that this um, user group had such an overwhelming variety of different requirements and these requirements were not the same in the slightest. If you, we, if you talk with 10 people, you get 10 different requirements they have uh, for this product. If you ask 100 people, they have 100 absolutely different requirements, which brought back a lot of complexity in this um, topic. And we, the key learning was no single solution we could have done in this first iteration of this product could ever cater to all these requirements at once, not even the slightest, not with the frame we had and the requirements uh, for the stakeholders. So this previous attempt could have never worked, which was an OK feeling for now. So. Um, then what did we do? We, we knew that we had to do something, and we put our backs into it, and we initiated a new project and tried to convince the stakeholders to go back to the uh, cutting floor and to, to do a new project and work very closely with these people to see if we can develop something for them. And that's exactly what we did. We got together with them very closely. We studied their requirements intensely and uh, looked at how they manage the things in their daily lives. Um, and we had interviews again and um, tests in very short intervals, went through different stages of prototyping with them together from paper prototypes to interactive dummies to up until in the end functional MVPs in the context. But um, what was even more special than the first time is we always came back to them with new questions and input and everyone involved, the whole team, had a feeling of knowing what we want to do at all times and what we don't want to do because we had that shared focus and that shared experience from the first round and still we had that motivation and energy from feeling that we can make an even bigger impact this time. And um, as a result, we were able to develop something that gave uh, this group the same possibilities as um, all the other target groups we had who gave us um, good scores and who said everything was good. So um, this was the point where we kind of finally could get this equality that we didn't have in the first step, where we actually made it less equal before. Now we had this equality and this accessibility back um, as we intended in the first place. And um, the key learning, oops, um, I'll skip a, skip a chart here. One of the key learnings is why did I tell you this whole story? Um, to get back to this, I think us as UX designers, we have a lot of power and we use, if we use it responsibly, we can actually help people navigate the uncertainty of their daily lives, um, which is of course our job, but in return, they can help us navigate the uncertainty of our job because um, the closer we work with them, the closer we know 
um, what to do and how to navigate our own uncertainty in the projects. And um, we have a lot of power and we should use it, and we should use it for the things that make us feel like we're doing the right thing. Right, I just want to uh, say some more sentences to kind of wrap it up, um, because I think another key learning of that project was that we need to take a closer look and that words actually matter. Because, of course, we also know that having a purpose, like I said in the introduction before, um, is nothing pretty special these days. It's more or less fashionable. And um, I think there are many purposes in the world. You may have a purpose for your, for your own. But um, I think some of these purposes are just words. And they are well-sounding sentences. And you can spread them and maybe you even get applause for them. Um, but the thing is that you, f you really need to find a purpose um, that really resonates with those who work for the ideas manifested in that purpose, and then you can find real strength in that. And that's why it is so important what words are used to describe um, that purpose. And to wrap it up, I think if we take our purpose as something that's very serious, this also has consequences. Um, it has consequences for the services we offer, it has consequences for the way uh, we build teams and even for the way we work together as, as a whole. So when we commit ourselves um, to a just cause and it becomes our personal purpose, um, the rest is really just design. Thanks for listening. Thank you.